Mead. Anyone else who makes me in the United States, when I say anybody else, I mean like anybody else. The other 250 meters, they will all tell you something. And that is that mead is the oldest intentionally fermented beverage on earth. I will not tell you that because we don't have verification of that fact. Milk. Hmm? Milk has been fermented for years. It has, but it's harder to ferment because lactose doesn't want to convert. Um, my money hangs on rotting fruit, personally. But what matters is, Mead was made 7,200 years ago at the absolute latest. It was probably made for thousands of years before that. And the reason is honey plus water becomes alcoholic. That's it. It's that easy. Go home. If you have raw honey, it has to be raw, mix the honey and the water, and it will start to bubble, and it will eventually be mead. If it's not raw honey, you just have to add yeast back. So, in fact, the yeast that you use to raise bread and brew beer and many of the wine strains are probably derived from honey originally. Uh, wild yeast just naturally occurs from the pollen collection. But rather than going in the science direction, why on earth do I make mead? And that is a great question that I ask myself every day. Uh, it's been four years without a paycheck now, so a really, really good question. Um, of the major beverages available in the United States, alcoholic, you have five that have names. You have beer, you have wine, you have cider. Now cider historically meant alcoholic cider. It was called juice or non-alcoholic cider originally. Sake. And mead, that's it. That's it. There are only five things. There are two really esoteric things. I would hear an argument that Perry uh, is still made. It's a type of cider that's made exclusively from pears. Uh, and then a really, really esoteric one, chicha, uh, which is made by chewing up corn and spitting it into a bucket and waiting for it to ferment. Uh, so not widely available. Um, <laughs> everything else that has a name in our language is a distilled beverage. Vodka, whiskey so on and so forth, which both of which, by the way, just mean water, uh, which tells you a lot about ancient people. Whiskey means little water, so does what's good. Uh, but 250 meters in the United States, most make honey wine. It's just what it sounds like. Picture for a moment, wine, if you've ever had that before, uh, that tastes ever so slightly like honey, or in my humble opinion, way too much like honey. One of the problems that we have is, uh, Nobody picks up a can of beer, drinks it, and goes, man, that didn't taste enough like cereal. <laughs> but people do that with my meat all the time. They go, well, why doesn't it taste like honey? For the same reason that beer doesn't taste like cereal? <clears throat> no one wants to drink a can of cereal? So what we do, and I'm really sorry I don't have drinks to hand out to you. You can come drink at my place. It's just a few miles that way. I've got lots of meat there. Um, if you haven't been, who's been to my brewery? One. Where, where is it? I'm it's sorry. back behind Costco in Colchester. Uh, we have a restaurant there. Actually, here's my, my, my one. It's going to sound like a brag until I tell you the end of it. Uh, three days ago, we got listed one of the top 10 restaurants to visit in New England by Boston Globe, yeah. um, which sounds great, right? Um, my entire kitchen is smaller than this table to the wall. <laughs> um, we do everything we do with a panini press, two thermalizers, we gave over part of it to a dishwasher named Hans, <laughs> <laughs> and almost all of our food is served by a bartender. We won a bunch of awards for it, which is kind of embarrassing for a brewery that's never won an award for making mead. Uh, that's because I don't compete, I've won one award. Uh, the one time I accidentally competed, I thought I was just showing up at a brew fest, but it turns out it was a competition. So we came in first. Anyway, um, but we're really excited about this because I'm very, very proud of my restaurant. We just have no idea what the repercussions will be if someone from Boston makes the mistake of driving all the way back behind the Costco in Colchester, Vermont, and walks into a place that looks essentially like the backside of 14th Star, just the brew side. Our restaurant floor is our production area. On canning days, we take all of our tables and put them in a pile. And then when people come in at four o'clock, we're usually mopping things down the floor drain and <laughs> telling them to avoid the electric cables. Uh, so it's, you know, totally OSHA certified. But 
there was no one making mead. Uh, most people that were making it, if they were making it at all, uh, was they were making honey wines. And I like them well enough. I make two under duress. Uh, my restaurant needs to have them. But I'm a craft mead guy. I wanted something that you could just pour down, just like a beer. And it didn't make sense to me that one of the five foundational beverages was missing. And to this day, I don't know exactly why it disappeared. Um, I only have a few more minutes. I have like a 45 minute lecture on the theories about why it disappeared, but you're not gonna hear that. Um, you have to have something to drink to, to go along with that. <laughs> I'm so entertaining, don't worry. Um, it's like being drunk listening to me. So, uh, the very short version is, what's the sacred beverage in the Abrahamic traditions? What? I'm sorry. What's the sacred beverage for Jews and Christians? It's wine, right? Rest of the world, what's their sacred beverage? Beer. Beer. Oh. Whose sacred beverage is mead? Used to be, oddly enough, Christians. Uh, we're not going to have that lecture. Royalty, Scandinavians, and Ethiopia. National beverage of Sweden and the national beverage of Ethiopia are both mead. How cool is that? Very is the answer. That's very cool. <laughs> but... <coughs> The problem was, beer had a place, it was the poor man's beverage. Uh, in New England, cider was the poor man's beverage, and then wine was the rich person's beverage, and me just didn't really have a niche in the market. Plus, honey commands enough value by itself, unlike grapes or grain, uh, that you're barely getting any value added to convert it into an alcoholic beverage. So that's my very short version of why I think it disappeared about 100 years ago from the shelves. But we make it, and it turns out that people want it because we're at 200 locations around the state of Vermont. We currently have nine employees uh, between restaurant brewing and sales, and we're doing something like 2,000 gallons a month, uh, which is tiny, tiny for someone like 14th Star, uh, but huge, huge for <laughs> craft meadery. As I said, we're only three and a half years old, and I believe we are the seventh largest meadery in the United States of the 250. Wow. Um, it's a really low bar to step over. Uh, I picked the right industry. Um, but that's the short version of what I do. Uh, we, the coolest thing I think about our company is we're open source. Every recipe, every technique, everything we do is available online for free to home brewers. Uh, I have a show called Ask the Mead Maker. We hit the 100th episode last week, which means I've answered 500 questions about mead making, which is nuts. I thought I would have maybe 12 questions Total, like in the whole course of my show, how many questions could there possibly be about mead making? Uh, but I like to think that the majority of the reason that I'm getting better as a brewer is because I get to deal with other people's mistakes uh, when they email me what's going wrong. So I'm really proud of that fact. It is the uh, biggest um, burden of my life getting that episode out every other week, but we haven't missed an episode yet, even the week my daughter was born. We pre recorded three of them, and then she was over two weeks late, so we, we ran out. Uh, shows what you know. It's way easier to have a kid than a business. So with that, we have a couple minutes left. Questions? Where do you get most of your honey? With the exception of one beverage of the 14 that I make, uh, and I could talk about that one, but why bother? Uh, all of my honey comes from a beekeeper about four hours from my brewery, or about three and a half hours from here uh, in Ontario. Uh, they have really good apiary support in Canada, and we don't really in the United States. Yeah. I understand honey can be many different flavors depending mm -hmm. upon the uh, area in which the, the bees are operating. Forage source, yep. And how does that affect you? So, uh, we, unfortunately, for reasons that I don't want to talk about, uh, we may have to switch honey for two batches. Uh, and I'm a little nervous about it. What we do is each batch I make takes between 1,800 and 2,600 pounds of honey. Uh, that works out to several drums. So I get it from one supplier. All of his are wild forage, uh, so wild flowers. But I will select um, seasonal. So spring 2016 always gets brewed with a fall 2016. Fall 2016 always gets brewed with a spring 2017. <coughs> so that I'm smoothing out those varietal characteristics, which the polyfloral source already takes care of. Um, but a lot of places, uh, they will have a batch of blueberry honey, and it will be light blue, and it will taste like blueberries, and stuff's fabulous, and it's 
out of, out of my pay grade, uh, they're using, you know, we're talking 28 to $40 a bottle, whereas I'm 12 bucks a four pack. Uh, so very different markets. Um, there are a handful of people that are doing pure varietal. It's a weird federal law that prevents you from labeling them as such, though, which really sucks if you spend all that money and you can't brag about it on the bottle. Uh, do you use any, any variety of hops or anything? I have one mead um, called Hop Swarm. Up until two weeks ago, it was called Bitter Bee. Uh, the problem is we don't boil our hops, so they never get bitter. Uh, so it was a great sounding name, just wildly inaccurate. Um, so Hop Swarm is my favorite thing we brew. It uses seven different hops in it. Uh, and I actually developed the technique for getting hops into mead that most other meaderies use. That's the other thing about being an open source company. There are other commercial meaderies, and they're free to use all of my developments as well. How long is the ferment fermentation? Uh, if you look online, not on my website, but anywhere else online, they'll be like six months to two years. Garbage. That's nonsense. Uh, we're honey to glass in three weeks. Um, I actually had an article out to the largest home brewing magazine, uh, and they rejected it as being too controversial uh, mm -hmm. because I said that I fermented things at 92 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, I basically said if someone says that mead takes six months, they're bad at making mead. And uh, that was a little <laughs> brash, but it would be like going to 14 Star and having them say, you know, oh, we're, we're you know, two weeks turnaround, but if you do it at home, it'll be a year. There is nothing that I can do that you can at home, especially meat-wise. I mean, honey plus water plus yeast. Biggest thing I've got that you don't have is temperature control. If you're a real nerd, you build yourself a temperature control fridge. But yeah, so we're about three weeks. Um, we are the fastest in the industry. Uh, most people that make stuff like mine are starting to catch up, though, because, as I said, I publish how we do it. Um, but a lot of places, they, they're they proud of the fact that they sit on that stuff for years. Then you're not paying for mead, you're paying for real estate. Mm -hmm. Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, would you uh, comment on the future of bees in the country and in mm -hmm. the world? So, everyone's familiar with colony collapse disorder. Um, it was misrepresented in the media, it turns out, by accident. Uh, Reporters didn't read the full reports, so uh, huge problem for wild pollinators. Honeybees are doing okay because honeybees have a financial incentive. They pollinate almond trees, they pollinate orange crops, they pollinate apple orchards, plus there's honey. Honey, if it, you're able to say, was all within the borders of, borders of this. I mean, Vermont honey is $14 a pound. That's not a bad price for, it's yellow gold, practically. I guess gold's yellow gold. But um, so honeybees are actually doing very, very well in thanks uh, to the Mondavi Institute, uh, the Canadian government, and a few other places that have really invested a lot of money into best practices that are being voluntarily taken on by beekeepers because they're seeing the results. That said, wild pollinator populations are just plummeting. And that means no tomatoes. No potatoes, uh, there's no squash, I believe. Uh, these are all plants that can't be pollinated by a honeybee. So uh, that's really the tough thing, and there's very, very little money in, uh, in, in wild pollinator health. We actually maintain two and a half acre uh, wild pollinator health plot up in Swanton. Now, the one concern that I've uh, read about is the transporting of bees to... All over the country all... moving, yep. Yeah. That's probably, the Vareramite uh, issue is the biggest one, and they are brought all over the country. Those are honeybees, correct? Yes, those are honeybees that they're dragging all over the country. So they're bringing uh, diseases and other things to wild populations uh, when they bring them back home. Uh, plus, climate change has just been brutalizing. <laughs> Uh, a lot of bee populations. And does the Canadian farm that you... Um, they don't move theirs at all. That's why we contract with them. They don't what? Sorry. They don't move their bees at all. I think that's it. Ricky. It's 2 o'clock. Look at yeah, that. I talked for an extra hour. <laughs> <laughs>